Jeremiah 26, please, as we uh, take a few moments to study the Word of God. And I believe that there's, I believe every anytime we open this book, there's something in there for us. I hope that you have that expectation. It is a book that's alive. And uh, just to encourage you a bit, you can get something from the Word of God, even in the driest of preaching, amen? Because uh, it's the Word of God. And uh, I pray that mine isn't dry. I want it to be uh, exciting, and, and uh, I want it to be have substance. Uh, but we've been making our way through the book of Jeremiah. Uh, I've enjoyed it, and uh, I've tried not to get sort of held down in places. I just wanted to move. We've done about a chapter a night, really, is the way we've done it. So uh, it's, it's tough to think this might have been tw- this might be 26 weeks that we've been doing this. Um, but uh, I, I, I pray that we leave with something uh, this evening. Uh, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 26, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. Now we have here in this chapter much of the same. Jeremiah receives the word of the Lord. He's a prophet. He receives the word of the Lord in an unusual way. Uh, Jeremiah doesn't go to a Bible to find the word of the Lord. The Bible's not finished yet. Jeremiah is being used of God to write part of it. So he gets a word from the Lord, whether that word be just uh, 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 comes into his heart or he hears the voice of God audibly. To be honest, I'm not really sure. Someday we'll be able to ask Jeremiah. Amen. Jeremiah, how'd you get the word from the Lord? How did it come? Was it through your ears? Was it through your mind? Was it through your heart? Uh, How did the word of God come? But no doubt he did receive the word of the Lord. And this time, like uh, several other times, God said, go stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak there. And part of the reason why Jeremiah spoke the words of God at the Lord's house, in the court of the Lord's house, was because three times a year, the entire nation gathered there. There were three major feasts through the year, and I believe that Jeremiah would speak there uh, at this point at, during one of those feasts because God said, when all the cities of Judah come. So no matter where you lived in the nation of Judah, three times a year, you and your family made your way to uh, the temple for this worship. You remember when Jesus was 12 years old, his family made a journey to the temple to worship. Do you remember? And they... Uh, Jesus stayed behind and they had to go find him and and because it was a long entourage of people that went to the temple it was one of those feasts and so I believe that Jeremiah had to deliver this word of the Lord while he's in the Lord's house in the court of the Lord's house during one of these uh, 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 three time a year feasts whether it's Passover or Pentecost or the Feast of Tabernacles and you can sort of imagine that Jeremiah is there in the court and it is super crowded I can't really, my, it's hard to think about how crowded it would be in the temple of the Lord and how busy and how much activity. And just to hear Jeremiah there proclaiming what God had told him uh, as the word of the Lord. And his message is the same. If you've been with us, most of you have been with us through these studies, Jeremiah's message is the same. His message is God knows your evil. God, God knows the evil that you're doing and the idolatry that you're, you have fallen into. He knows your evil ways. God says, turn back to me and repent, and I will not bring the judgment upon you that's coming. So like always, Jeremiah gives the same message. God knows how you've strayed. He is commanding you to come back and walk in his ways, and then God will stay the judgment. Uh, Verse number three of verse number 26. If so be they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Come back to me, and there will not be judgment. But one phrase in here caught my attention. It's at the end of verse number two, and it is the phrase, diminish not a word. And that's a a, a peculiar phrase. Um, Diminish not a word. Jeremiah had an awesome responsibility to take the words that God gave him and give those words to the nation. And God stressed it to the prophet this way, diminish not a word. Um, What a huge amount of accountability Jeremiah had. 
And I, just by way of introduction, if you'll give me just a few minutes, I, I, I want us to understand the importance of God's words not being diminished. Do you know how sin came into this world? It's because Satan is crafty at diminishing the word of God. Some of you, most of you will know. Um, Yea, hath God said, thou shalt not eat of every tree of the garden? The serpent said. And Eve said to the serpent, God has said we shall not eat of every tree of the garden, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And then Satan just attacked one word. Remember the word? Thou shalt not surely die. What about that word die? Maybe it's, maybe it's metaphoric. Maybe it, it just doesn't really mean what God what you think God meant it to mean. And question that one word. In, in other words, it, 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 let me say it this way. Satan diminished the word of God, and here we are today in the sin problem. So I want to just caution us tonight, and, and by doing so, I think encourage us. Let's stand on all the words of God and not diminish them. And maybe it's more for, maybe it's more for me than for you because of I'm so thankful God has called me to be a preacher and I don't want to diminish the word of God. But here's some phrases that I hear tossed around uh, a little bit. Uh, the Bible is a human book. The Bible is not a human book. It's a divine book. It's God's book. Amen. I've heard people say this. I disagree with the Apostle Paul on that issue. <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh, dear brother or sister, this book is not the Apostle Paul's book. It's God's book. Uh, it's not our job. I just heard this on, on a little video that I watched. They were interviewing a, a well-known national pastor, and this is what he said. It's not my job to talk about sin. It's just my job to love people. And I thought, that really, in, in, in true definition, is diminishing the words of God. I mean, the fact is, we are to love people. But when you say, I'm not supposed to talk about sin, I'm just to love people, you've taken the word of God and you've diminished it diminished it. It is God's wisdom that gave Jeremiah every word, every single word that Jeremiah was supposed to say. It was God's wisdom that gave Jeremiah every word to say, and Jeremiah had no right to say, well, that one should slide out and this one should slide in, because it was God's wisdom that framed and formed the words that were given to Jeremiah. <clears throat> Even if those words didn't ring particularly true to the prophet, and, and if you follow along with this, you know, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because the whole idea of Judah being judged bothers him. The patriotism of this man who is a Jew and he lives in Judah and he loves the people. And, and what prophet would want to see all of these people destroyed? And I, I just have to sort of feel with this man that to deliver every one of God's words had to be a little hard for Jeremiah because who wants to see the temple destroyed? Who wants to see the city of Jerusalem laid waste? Who wants to see the people carried off in judgment? Who wants to see the, the bloodshed that will come when Babylon comes in? Nobody wants to see that. And in Jeremiah's mind and in his heart, he could have questioned some of those words that God gave, them, gave him and maybe he could have diminished a few. He could have just slid a couple down and maybe not as severe. Jeremiah must give every word that God gave him. The Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Some will say, well, that particular Bible truth doesn't resonate with me. That's really another way to diminish the word of God. And the words that Jeremiah were given were not only wisely formed by God, but these words were for man's necessity. Because, see, it could have been easy for Jeremiah to say, you know, why don't we just say it a little nicer? Lord, why do we have to, I mean, this whole thing of, 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 the, na of the city becoming a heap, you interpret that in your own mind. Or the, this whole thing of, of, of just, uh, uh, it just sounds so negative. Can't we just frame this in a little positive way? But the people that were gathered in Jerusalem on that day needed to hear the words exactly like God gave them to Jeremiah. Exactly. They needed to hear them because of sin's peril and the blessedness of the life of obedience. 
so not to diminish the word of God. We can diminish the word of God by being silent. I just want to throw some things out there. You say, how can I diminish the word of God? Sometimes we diminish what God said just by not saying it. It's our silence or maybe our selective nature that we just pick and choose what we would rather say. That diminishes the word of God. Or we will minimize some uh, words of God in quantity or emphasize some words of God in, uh, in quantity. This diminishes also the word of God. And some diminish the word of God simply because they disagree with what God said, although they won't say that. Uh, they feel God is too stern or... Or I prefer to, to focus on the tender love of God and the sweet grace of God and I don't want to offend the gentle heart and I don't want to appeal to fear. Here's a few other phrases that I've heard uh, over the years. Uh, I just can't believe God would send someone to hell. Have you ever heard that phrase? And really, the truth is God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. Are we right? But when you say that I feel like God wouldn't send anybody to hell, you've taken the words of God and diminished them. When you're in a court of law, you raise your hand and you say, I, do you promise to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? But one thing's missing. The whole truth. Do you promise to tell the truth? Yes. And nothing but the truth? Yes, so help you God. But if you don't put the whole truth in there, the court still gets a misrepresentation. I mean, you can tell the truth and nothing but the truth, but if you don't include all of the truth, then the real story is not known. Someone says, well, well, did you see him go into the store? Yes. But you never said, I saw him shoot the clerk. Well, I told the truth. I saw him go in the store. Yeah, but you swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I'll be back. I think there's a lot of power in this phrase, don't diminish a word. And maybe God told Jeremiah that because Jeremiah had a temptation in his heart to diminish a few words of what God had said. Some will say the Bible needs updated. It needs to be brought into today's framework. But look at verse number 8 of our text. Verse number 8. I want to just give some... Some props to Jeremiah. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking. And what's the next word? All that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people. That the priests and the prophets and the people took him saying, Thou shalt surely die. So here we are. Jeremiah doesn't diminish any words. Big crowded place in Jerusalem. He delivers every word from God. You've got to repent, turn back to the Lord. This place is going to be destroyed if you don't. And now in verse number 8, they take him. By taking him, that means he was arrested. Not only was he arrested, but they placed a charge on him and a, and a penalty, which is simply, thou shalt surely die. He was condemned to the death penalty. Verse number 9, why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So here's what I want us to see tonight. Um, and this is the title of my message. How to handle false accusation. Because when I study this out, I, I, uh, really there's two main things that I, I, I think we'll take away from this. But Jeremiah is being uh, some heavy false accusation here. Um, they are uh, accusing him of blasphemy. They are accusing him of insurrection. They are accusing him of, him, of him of a tumult. And now he is arrested. He's been condemned by the prophets and the priests. Uh, that's in verse number 8. The priests and the prophets and all the people took him. And if I could just throw this out here, see if this doesn't have some application. Jeremiah was a prophet and a priest. So it is his own comrades that take Jeremiah and say, you're going to die, pal, for what you say, for your delivering of the words that you say are from God. Uh, verse number 10 tells us that the princes of Judah heard these things. Then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord. I had to do a little study into this. Who are the princes? The princes seem to be the 
political side of leadership. The priests and the prophets are the religious side of leadership. And the princes are from the king's house. They are the political, uh, um, more uh, the social side of, of the leadership. And so the princes come to uh, the house of the Lord to hear because they've heard this accusation and someone has been uh, uh, sentenced to die. And so from the king's house they come and they sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests, this is verse 11, and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he has prophesied against this city as ye have heard with your ears. So, how is Jeremiah going to handle this accusation? How is he going to handle this group of people who come to him with these allegations that could take his life? Uh, here's the first thing. Jeremiah was honest with himself. And uh, have you ever been accused? Who, oh, who hasn't? Who hasn't been accused? You know the best thing to do first? Be honest with yourself. Nothing wrong with taking some good evaluation. Good evaluation of what's being said. What have I done? Who am I? Is it true? Uh, it may be that Jeremiah was sitting incarcerated for one day, two days, three days, we don't know how long it took for the word to get back to the king's house that Jeremiah had been arrested and how long it took for the princes to make their way to the house of the Lord to oversee this uh, sort of this trial of whether Jeremiah is going to be put to death or not. We don't know how many days it was. But when Jeremiah is sitting, whether it's one day, two days, three days, or maybe a week, but when he's sitting there arrested, wondering if he's going to be killed for what he just said in the temple of the Lord, he has a lot of time to think. Somebody told me prison gives you a lot of time to think. I don't know by experience, by the way, but some of the prison gives you a lot of time to think. And that time to think is some self-evaluation. And here's the two ways it could have gone, if you'll follow me here. Two ways it could have gone, and we know this in our heart. It could have gone two ways. Number one, Jeremiah could have been consumed with guilt that he did something wrong. Or that time to think could have given him the assurance of, a, of gladness of a clear conscience. So either two things, either he's going to have a guilty conscience and be miserable, or he's going to have a clear conscience and have some gladness. So what is it as he takes this evaluation of himself? Verse number 12. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you look at verse number 15 but know ye for certain this is verse 15 that if ye put me to death ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof for of a truth the lord hath sent me to speak unto, unto you to speak all the all these words in your ears here here's the way i i uh, uh process that jeremiah was able to say look i know that i've done the right thing I know that I've acted courageously. It was hard, but I acted courageously. I know that I acted selfless, selflessly because part of, I, I believe, part of Jeremiah's feelings was, I don't want this city destroyed, and I don't want this nation destroyed, and I don't want these people destroyed, but I am putting myself aside to say every word that God told me to say. He knows that he acted truthfully. He knows that he did not act with malice. Because Jeremiah knew, he did honest self-evaluation. I've been honest, I've been upright, I've been truthful, I've been obedient, I've tried to be courageous, I've acted right, I've acted the way exactly what God's told me to do. That's, the, that's one of the few things that brought him through this time. One of the hardest things to endure is accusation when you know you're guilty. This sustained him. Can I read a scripture to you? Many of you know it. Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you 
and say all manner of evil against you. Anybody know the next word? Falsely. You say, oh, the Bible says you're blessed if men revile you. You're blessed if people persecute you. The Bible says you're blessed if they bring evil against you. Uh uh. Only if it's done falsely. If it's done truthfully, there's no blessing there. There's no blessing that God gives for an accusation that comes our way unless it's done falsely and unless it's done for the sake of the Lord. That's how the blessing falls. The blessing falls on the man who may be falsely accused or the woman who's falsely accused, but yet in their heart they know that they've tried to act selflessly and they've tried to behave truthfully and they've tried not to have any malice. They've, they've, They've tried to pursue courageously and act justly before the Lord and their heart is right with God. You can endure some accusation when that's the case but when it's not there it's hard let's all turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 I think this would uh, help us to understand this tonight we'll be back in Jeremiah 26 in just a minute but 1 Peter 3 16 1 Peter 3 16 16. The Bible says in verse number 16 of chapter number 3, having a good conscience. I believe that's Jeremiah when he's for three or four days waiting for the princes to come and am I going to die? What's going to happen? I believe he had a good conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accused. Now here it is. Your good conversation in Christ. That word conversation means living or lifestyle. So let me just give you an illustration that came to my mind. Uh, You can't really be the one that, that, that steals and steals and steals and steals and steals and steals. And then the one time something comes up missing and you didn't really take it, but somebody said you took it and you're like, I can't believe you're accusing me. I can't believe that I got accused of stealing when I didn't take that particular thing from work. Yeah, but your lifestyle is steal, 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 steal. There's no blessing in a false accusation when the one time you don't. Part of the blessing that Jeremiah received was that he had been faithful to God all this time. He had diligently delivered the word to the people all of this time. It wasn't just that he had delivered falsehoods like the other priests and falsehoods like the other prophets and had blasphemed the name of the God all this time. And then the one time he says something right and they falsely accuse him, he's like, what's the deal? I believe there's a, a strong, Bible, there's strong Bible evidence that you have a good conscience when your conversation is right in Christ and when the ac- accusation comes, God pours a blessing on you because of the good lifestyle and conversation you've maintained even when you're falsely accused. And he is so sure, Jeremiah is so sure that he did the right thing. I I thought this was really cool. Back in 26, Jeremiah is so sure that he said and did the right thing. Look at verse number 13. He says the exact same thing again. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. Have you ever had someone say, if I had it to do all over again, that could be I would change something or it could be I would do exactly the same thing again. So here's a little self-evaluation. When there's a false accusation, let me, let me, when there is an accusation, can you say, if I had it to do all over again, God is my witness, I would do it exactly the same again. That's some honest evaluation. And Jeremiah is so sure that he would do exactly the same thing again that he does exactly the same thing again. What a godly servant. What a man of admirable patriotism. What a tender-hearted man, full of compassion and love for the people, that he gives them the truth of God again, maybe thinking, this might be my last time. So I'm going to do it again. 
When you're falsely accused, just evaluate yourself. Let's evaluate ourselves and say, Lord, is it I? Is it I? It's what happened on that, around that table, that last supper. One of you will betray me. What an accusation. Lord, is it I? Honest self-evaluation, is it I? And this second thing is really important. And we'll close with this. Be restful in God's care. Uh, look at verse number, uh, well, verse number 12, Jeremiah speaks to the princes and said, I just told you what God told me to say, and he repeats it in verse number 13. Now look at verse 14. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. Like, wow, Jeremiah. <laughs> He says, kill me if you want. Want to kill me? Kill me. You think that's the right thing to do? Go ahead. Now, the next verse, he says, you kill me, you're going to shed innocent blood in this place. But you want to kill me? Kill me. This man's ready to die. I believe he is so resting and so assured in the care of God and so confident in his service to the Lord and in his obedience to, to God that he is, he is very able to say without any hesitation, kill me if you want. Because I've completed what God wanted me to do. I've done what God what wanted me, uh, has wanted me to do. He doesn't have much care for himself. You know what he cares about? He cares about God and he cares about those people. I'm just being honest. Kill me. I'm inconsequential. It's like, it's your, I, why don't it matter? Kill me. But I care about God and his words, and I care about you, this nation. His concern was for the people. His words seem to say that he realizes he is of little consequence in the whole broad scheme of things. And so the chapter gives us two examples. This is really neat. There's two examples in the chapter of other prophets. The first one is found in verse 17. There's another prophet here in, verse, in chapter 26. Uh, verse number 17 and 18. Then rose up certain of the elders of the land and spake to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah. Do you know Micah? There's a book in the Bible called Micah. Micah was a prophet before Jeremiah, and just so we know, Micah said the same thing Jeremiah says, although it was earlier. Micah, you can look it up, chapter number three of Micah. Micah, Micah said, God's going to destroy this place if you all don't change your ways. Repentance is in order. And they didn't listen to Micah. So the question is, well, did Micah die? Uh, look at verse number 19. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Question mark. Did he not fear the Lord and besought the Lord, and the Lord repented him of the evil which he had pronounced against them? Against them? Thus might we procure great evil against our souls. Here's the conclusion of that matter. Micah wasn't killed. So you got to picture, this is sort of a trial here, and they're bringing in past cases. Right? Don't, they, don't they do that in legal things? Well, in something, something versus something, something, uh, here is, uh, in the state versus Micah case precedent, he was uh, accused of, you know, saying these words against the house of the Lord, and, and the king didn't kill him. And I can just imagine Jeremiah going, yes, yes, use that case. But there's another prophet, verse number 20. There was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Urijah, the son of Shemaiah of kirjath Jearim, who prophesied against this city and against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. Now, I tried to look up whatever I could about this Urijah, and I came up with nothing, except for what we have here in chapter 26. So here is an unknow un unknown, not much known about this Urijah, but he says the same thing Micah said, Amend your ways, or God's going to destroy the land. You've got to repent. Jeremiah, amend your ways. God's going to destroy the land unless you repent. Uriah, amend your ways. God will destroy the land unless you repent. So what happened to Uriah? Verse 21. And when Jehoiakim the king, and when all his mighty men and all the princes heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. It's just like Jeremiah's case. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went into Egypt. Now that struck me. You don't read about Micah running. 
and you don't read about Jeremiah running. But you read about Uriah said, I'm out of here. I'm going to Egypt. I'm getting out of this place. It's too heavy. It's, I feel threatened. My life is in jeopardy. I'm out. Verse 22, And Jehoiakim the king sent men unto Egypt, namely El Nathan, the son of Ekbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. And they fetched forth Uriah out of Egypt and brought him unto Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with the sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. See, in this courtroom, they're bringing up some past cases. Here's Micah. He said the same thing. He lived. And I can imagine the prosecutor. You know, the defense brought up Micah's case. And now the prosecuting attorney comes up and says, yeah, but what about Uriah? Let's look at that case. He said the same thing, and, and uh, the king of Judah killed him. He died by the sword. You say, well, what's the difference in these two cases? Personally, I believe the problem was Uriah ran. You say, well, what would you do? I don't know. Maybe I'd run. What would you do? You know? But here's what I'm taking away from Jeremiah and Micah. Here were two men who said, you know, we're so sure that your accusations are wrong, and we are so sure that we are right with God, I ain't running. God's going to take care of me. I wonder if we have that much faith that when we're accused, especially falsely accused, that we can say, you know, God take care of this whole thing. Always does. Always does. The running and the anxiety is of no use. It's always better to trust than to stand fearlessly for the Lord. Can I give you some examples as I close of people falsely accused? Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. You remember? God took care of him. Am I right, church? God took care of him. Moses was falsely accused, and the leaders of the nation came around and said, Moses, you're just a prideful leader. We know the truth. There was no meeker man on earth than Moses. That's what God said. And the people said, you're a prideful leader. You just usurp your authority over all of us, and, and we don't want you to lead us. Moses was so meek, but he was falsely accused, number 16. David was accused. You remember what David was accused of? Saul accused David of conspiracy to kill him. And there was nobody in the whole kingdom who had more respect and care and carefulness for Saul than David. David would not raise a finger to hurt Saul, but yet Saul, you're a conspiracy to kill me. But here's what we know. God took care of David. Nehemiah was falsely accused, and when he was rebuilding the walls, a guy named Gashmu, I always love that name, Gashmu, G-A-S-H-M-U, he sent letters all around to the, to the uh, 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 Persian kings to say that uh, 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 Nehemiah is building these walls because he wants to uh, rebel against the, uh, against the uh, Medes and the Persians. And that wasn't true. Ne Nehemiah was Artaxerxes' cutbearer. He loved the king. Falsely accused. God took care of Nehemiah. I thought about Stephen. Let's go to the New Testament. You know what they accused Stephen of? Blaspheming God. You know why they picked up stones to throw them at Stephen? They accused him of blaspheming God. And you and I both know, some of you seasoned believers, you couldn't find a man who loved God more than Stephen. So falsely accused. I thought about Paul. Accused of teaching against God's law. Oh, oh, back up. You say, well, God didn't take care of Stephen. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. you got to read it yourself. Stephen got an entrance into heaven like few others ever get. God took care of Stephen. The Bible says that God stood up when Stephen went into heaven. Well, Paul was falsely accused of breaking the law and hating Jews. But Paul prayed, I'd rather be a curse than my people can be saved. Falsely accused, God took care of Paul. One big one I thought of is Job. Satan came to God and said, the only reason why he loves you is because you give him so much. You take away what you've given him and he will curse you. What a false accusation. Job loved God. 
And it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the family. It wasn't about his health. Because Job stayed faithful to God through all of that. False accusation. The question is, when Jeremiah was falsely accused, did God take care of Jeremiah? Well, let's just read the last verse and find out. Jeremiah 26, 24. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. God took care of Jeremiah through a false accusation. I just want to encourage you tonight. God always takes care of his own through a false accusation. Always. Can we bow our heads for prayer for a moment tonight? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, just for a moment to think.